Thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be here and to speak with all of you about the spectrum of intraocular lymphoma. I don't have any financial disclosures to report. And this is an actual email that I received from a journal editor some years ago asking me to write a review on this subject. And perhaps Sorry, all of I interrupt you, ma'am. Please share your screen, ma'am. Your slide is not visible, madam. Oh, give me one second here. Roger. We can see your slides now. Yes, yes. No. I apologize. Can you, can you see it now? Yes, looks good. Great, sorry about that. Um, so this is an actual email that I received from an editor from a journal some years ago asking me to rewrite uh, a review on this subject. And we may have all have felt this way at times because lymphomas can be very challenging to diagnose and to treat. So I'm hoping I can shed some light on this subject and also to share some of my uh, more challenging cases with all of you. I'm gonna talk about the full spectrum of intraocular lymphoma and how to differentiate the various forms based upon their clinical features and also just share some practice pearls. Specifically, I wanna talk about how these tumors are very good at masquerading, how we have this added challenge of the fact that many of our patients come to us on steroids and how that affects the diagnosis and, and staging of this disease, how ancillary imaging can be helpful uh, the importance of doing a thorough examination, and a little bit about biopsy of these tumors. Broadly, intraocular lymphomas can be categorized as vitreoretinal lymphomas, uveal lymphomas, and secondary intraocular manifestations of systemic lymphomas. Let's start with primary vitreoretinal lymphoma. These can be thought of as a variant of central nervous system lymphoma, these are high-grade aggressive lymphomas that are predominantly diffuse large B-cell in origin. They can also be, in a very small percentage of cases, T-cell or natural killer cell lymphomas. They have a very poor prognosis. They can involve the brain, the spinal cord, leptomeninges, and of course, the eyes. If we take all comers with primary central nervous system lymphoma, approximately a quarter of them will have vitreoretinal involvement at the time of diagnosis. And if we look at patients who present with vitreoretinal lymphoma, nearly 60 to 90% will ultimately develop central nervous system disease over time. Classic features are vitreous cell, particularly when the cells are exuberant or clumped or demonstrate that classic aura borealis appearance. Subretinal pigment epithelium infiltrates are also common. I want to talk to you about a case that I saw recently and we published in the Journal of Vitreoretinal Diseases. This is a good example of how these tumors can really masquerade. I call this case Here Today, Gone Tomorrow. It's a 65 year old Asian American woman who had blurry vision in floaters for about a year. And she was noted uh, before she was referred to me to have a peripapillary infiltrate in the left eye. So here you can see the left fundus and she has this creamy yellow to white subretinal infiltrate above the optic nerve. It's very pronounced. And here's her OCT. You can see that she has this um, infiltrate involving the subretinal pigment epithelium if you look very carefully on the OCT, you can see that she has some vitreous cell. And even more pronounced is this subretinal infiltrate. Now, whether that's an inflammatory infiltrate or those are lymphoma cells, it's hard to know for sure. But we did biopsy her vitreous and it confirmed diffuse large B-cell lymphoma with positive MyD88 mutation, clenching the diagnosis. Here's the amazing thing. We saw her a couple of times over the period in which she was undergoing her staging evaluation, meaning she was getting her MRI brain, lumbar puncture, um, blood test, systemic evaluation, and that infiltrate disappeared completely without any treatment. Amazing. This is spontaneous regression. 
And here's her OCT. You can see that that subretinal infiltrate disappeared completely and the RPE even looks better. Again, this is without any treatment. I have to wonder how often that happens and, and we're not aware of it. Um, here's another case. This could be viral retinitis, but it's not. This is a, a gentleman who has known primary central nervous system lymphoma with ocular involvement, and he got better with systemic high dose methotrexate. Here's another case that looks like peripheral vasculitis. The lymphoma is a great masquerader. It can look like a number of other entities, and that makes it challenging to, to diagnose. Here's a case that demonstrates the challenge of the fact that many of our patients come to us on steroids. This is a 72-year-old Caucasian lady with a history of, quote, uveitis. She had had uh, floaters for about eight months. She had a negative uveitis workup that was fairly extensive, and her symptoms and clinical findings were progressive despite topical and oral steroids. So we have a very high index of suspicion that this may actually be lymphoma. Clinical findings are classic. She has vitreous um, cell, creamy subretinal infiltrates. Here's a closer view of the sub-RPE infiltrate. Here's the left eye. Again, lots of cells, haze, hemorrhage, subretinal infiltrate. And the fluorescein shows foci of uh, punctate hyperfluorescence scattered throughout the fundus, which is classic for vitreoretinal lymphoma. OCT shows uh, sub-RPE infiltration, again, classic for vitreoretinal lymphoma. And, and we decided she didn't have any findings uh, other than the eye when we met her. So we did a diagnostic vitrectomy, but she came to us on 60 milligrams of oral prednisone, which she had been on for a month. So we tapered her off of that rapidly before we did her vitrectomy, and we got positive cytology on the first try. This was atypical lymphoid infiltrate consistent with a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and a positive MIDE88 mutation. But I wanna make this point. When we met her and she had her initial staging, she had this MRI, and the neuroradiologist did pick up on this finding that I have highlighted with the red arrow and described it as probable age-related microvascular uh, ischemic disease, consider repeating MRI in the coming months. Well, I uh, really pushed her primary team to repeat her staging after she had been tapered off of the steroids. Here she is one month following cessation of steroids. Here's her MRI. That is not microvascular ischemic disease, that's lymphoma, and it entirely stages entirely changes her uh, baseline staging and her treatment plan. Furthermore, they also repeated her lumbar puncture and that showed atypical lymphocytes concerning for involvement of her known diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So she doesn't have vitreoretinal lymphoma. She has bilateral ocular disease, brain and CSF findings. That really changes her management and it's so important to recognize the lympholytic effect that steroids can have on these patients. So let's change gears and talk about uveal lymphoma. Uveal lymphoma, also a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma of B-cell origin, tends to be more indolent with a better prognosis. The majority of cases are extranodal marginal zone, although they can be other subtypes, and these are very low-grade lymphomas. Ancillary imaging can be very helpful Here's a case demonstrating that. It's a 48-year-old Caucasian male who had had fluctuating vision in the left eye for two years and good vision. The fundus shows lobular creamy choroidal infiltrates scattered throughout the fundus. And I love how ICG just highlights those infiltrates and makes them really uh, stand out. I like to do ultrasound in both the affected and the fellow eye, because in addition to seeing choroidal thickening, sometimes we see these areas of extrascleral extension with have, have a predilection for being near the optic nerve. And that provides an additional site for biopsy, particularly when these flat uh, lobular choroidal infiltrates are really not amenable to biopsy and doing choroidal biopsies in general has a high complication rate. So this is just an additional site of biopsy, something to think about. Here's the correlate with neuroimaging. You can see the extrascleral extension. And here's another similar case. 68-year-old Caucasian male. It had elevated pressure in the right eye for a year. He has these creamy 
choroidal infiltrates, more pronounced in the left eye. The ICG highlights those areas of infiltration within the choroid. And the ultrasound shows diffuse choroidal thickening and also a substantial area of extrascleral extension near the optic nerve. So this is where I like to pause when I'm speaking to the residents and fellows and ask what they think that we should do next. And they will often enthusiastically point out that this is an area that we can biopsy. And I say, that's right, but we didn't. Because when we lift his eyelid, he had this salmon patch and that's much easier to biopsy. So it's just very important um, to be very thorough when examining this patient, these patients. And this is something that we have um, noted, it's been pointed out before, and we've looked at our patients who have ocular adnexal lymphoma, and we noted that almost 16% of them have uveal involvement. And you can look at that vice versa in patients with uveal lymphoma and see that some um, proportion of them are gonna have ocular adnexal lymphoma. And Arun Singh has published on this too, that really we can think of uveal lymphoma as a variant of ocular adnexal lymphoma. I have one case that I wanna show you that highlights something important about secondary intraocular manifestations of systemic lymphoma. This is a 63 year old man who had an incidentally noted choroidal mass. His last dilated fundus examination was a year ago and it was normal and he had relatively good vision. The interesting thing about him is he has a history of systemic diffuse large B-cell lymphoma back in 2008, and that involved his right clavicle. He uh, had treatment for that and had no evidence of a disease for about 10 years following. When he presented with the choroidal mass, he had restaging. So he had a full body PET CT, he had blood work, he had a bone marrow biopsy. There was no evidence of any recurrence of his lymphoma anywhere. And here's what the eye looked like. Here's a closer view of that tumor in the right eye. And you can see it's in the choroid, it's amelanotic. It appears to have some vascularity within it. And that is confirmed with the angiogram. You can see there's some vascularity within this tumor. On the ultrasound, it's sizable, 16.6 millimeters by 14.9 by seven and a half millimeters in thickness with some overlying exudative retinal detachment. And on the A scan, it demonstrates low internal reflectivity. He had an MRI and on the T1 post contrast sequence, the tumor was hyper intense and on T2, it was hypo intense. So everything that I have shown you is um, basically typical of a choroidal melanoma. But you might say, well, why, why did he get this MRI? And the reason is that he presented initially to our emergency room with proptosis. And so in the emergency room, he had this MRI and he was found to have a right orbital mass. So he has an orbital mass and an intraocular mass. And the question is this lymphoma, is this a recurrence of his known systemic lymphoma with intraocular and orbital involvement? Or does he have a uveal melanoma with orbital lymphoma? Could it be a melanoma with extraocular extension or is it something else? So we biopsied the choroidal tumor um, using a fine needle, fine needle aspiration biopsy technique. And then we also did an orbital uh, biopsy of that component. And the two biopsies were highly concordant and they showed lymphocytes, large lymphocytes that were positive uh, for CD20 suggesting a B-cell origin and negative for MART1, the melanoma stain. So the diagnosis here is diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, both with intraocular and orbital component. And that's very important for him because it entirely changes his um, treatment regimen. So in summary, vitreoretinal lymphoma is a high-grade, aggressive, typically diffuse large B-cell lymphoma with a poor prognosis. Key features are vitreous cells and sub-RPE infiltrates, it's a very good masquerader, and we should have a high index of suspicion, particularly in our elderly patients who have new onset uveitis. And always remember that steroids can influence the diagnosis and, and really that they can impact staging. Uveal lymphoma is a low-grade, indolent, predominantly extranodal marginal zone lymphoma. It's characterized by uveal infiltrates. We can think of it as a variant of ocular adnexal lymphoma. 
And just remember that within this spectrum of intraocular lymphoma, each one has distinct clinical features and that they can be differentiated. Always do a thorough ophthalmic examination. Um, ancillary imaging is very helpful. Systemic evaluation and always collaborate with your oncology teams when treating these patients. Um, and speaking of collaborators, I just want to thank all of the, um, the oncologists, my ophthalmology colleagues, our pathologists, ultrasound team, um, who have worked with me on these cases and, and, and shared their expertise with me. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am.